Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, I've been introduced yesterday by Barbara, and uh, welcome to the Red Dot Stream, doing away with labor, working and caring in a world of commons which I have co coordinated. And of course, we all know that this is rather meant to provoke and that if women were to stop going into labor, our human species would cease to exist. In this stream, you are invited to join our expeditions into rethinking the role of human reproductive activity and its inherent nature in a generative commons network. And yes, we want to do away with the rather predominant notion of labor as employment and as a commodity that we buy and sell in the market and reframe our understanding of employment as what is behind and this behind is employability, the human capacity or ability to work. We then can consider these plentiful capacities as a common pool resource and move from there to imagine what it would take to organize it as a commons. This framing session now will be followed after lunch by the first labor stream breakout session that will feature six different speakers. And they will, in their own individual speakers' corners, drill deeper, challenge or recapture aspects that the following keynote will touch upon. We have invited Daniela Gottschlich for this keynote. She is a political scientist at Leuphana University in Lüneburg. Feminist theory and practice is the academic and political environment Daniela comes from, and the care economy is the perspective from where she approaches the commons debate. We have chosen her to present as a younger generation feminist who has inherited and carries on the fruits of long years' fights and discussions that the preceding generation of feminists has contributed to reframe the economy from a fem feminist economics perspective. And it is an absolute necessity to flag and honor these contributions. Now, I was to say it's all yours, Daniela. Unfortunately, Daniela is very sick today and she had to stay in bed in Lüneburg and she has sent me her prepared material. But you all know that it is not easy to pre present on somebody else's behalf. But I'm now trying to replace her. I had to mess around <laughs> with Daniela's material to fit it for 30 minutes, but we will upload the full presentation and text for whoever is interested to go after it. Daniela, our best wishes from here. Get better soon. So I think now I'm starting... So in our exchange and debates with feminists and feminist economists such as Friederike Habermann, for example, who is here, or Veronica Benhold-Thompson, who couldn't make it this time, or Adelheid Biesecker and now in preparation for this uh, framing session with Daniela again, a key interest from a commons perspective um, is the structural commonalities between caring and commoning. So let's examine this. So similarities of uh, both concepts are that they criticize the prevailing economic rationale they emphasize the human dimension. That means the wealth must meet the livelihood needs of the people rather than to serve the markets. They are both based on cooperation and responsibility. They are relational. They must be constantly created and recreated. They embody an ethics of care, ethics of reciprocity, 
that point to many possible ways out of social and ecological crises. So if we have examined the uh, similarities, what are then the differences? So we are uh, comparing common space peer production and care work to make this comparative exercise imaginable. But of course, common space peer production is not equally 100% to commoning. Whereas in common space peer production, activities work, um, uh, um, activities or work um, are self-determined and of individual choice. In care work, reproductive activities um, we have to do with activities that the society cannot do away uh, with, cannot do without. It's indispensable. Whereas in common space peer production, humans are considered to be socially independent. In the care work, Humans are considered to be fragile beings. You know that half of our lives we are dependent on others in young age and then again when we are old and need care. Whereas in common space peer production, we have symmetrical cooperation between people with equal rights and equal status. In the care, we have asymmetrical cooperation between caregiver and care receiver. And in care, it is, because the work is indispensable, impossible to withdraw from caring, whereas if you're fed up with a peer community, to just drop out, go for another one. So that means there are structural commonalities between these two practices, but they are not interchangeable. These differences indicate a core question for our stream how to combine caring and commoning in order to ensure the reproduction of society as a whole. Let's now shed some light onto the thinking of feminist economists and look at this link between organization of care and commons. Feminist economists consider the services of nature the productivity or reprodu reproductivity of nature, subsistence activities, and the unpaid care activities as the foundation for all ec economic activities. The prevailing economic system, however, makes these realities invisible. Much, uh, much like the ecological productivity of living nature, Unpaid care activities are excluded from the economics. Well, and there are trends to account the value and monetize these activities. I will return to these questions and the related problems. So if you now look at this uh, small tip of the iceberg, it beautifully depicts how flawed our system and thinking is. We really need to put this upside down. So imagine this as an ice cone instead. How much yummy good life ice cream could we share and lick together? In the prevailing understanding of economics, um, market economics, um, uh, uh, economics uh, is restricted to market economy processes following strictly monetized determination. Whereas in life provisioning e economics, such as care activities or nature, uh, nature and ecosystem productivity, are considered of low value. Whereas, yeah, a feminist eco uh, economics criticizes the structural division between productive work and care work and its different validation. And this separation is linked to systemic mechanisms such as externalization, devaluation, exploitation. And these processes are the underlying causes for the crisis of reproductivity. So feminist economists, however, stress the productivity of reproductive activities and commoners would formulate that as the inherently generative power of 
reproductive activities. So uh, we call for the conscious design of the whole of economics and the whole of necessary work, the whole of the absolutely indispensable work to ensure the whole for our livelihood pro provisioning. This means to consider all types of human activity that has uh, so far been externalized. So now, how do we restructure, reorganize, rethink work? The whole of work concept is also critical of what we call gainful employment or paid labor. And this is because it is either alienating us from core activities for life provisioning or because it is precarious or in other words, we should live to work and not work to live. And work should be fun as much as possible. So what do we need instead? We need a system that enables social reproduction without social and ecological destruction. We need to switch perspectives, use the principle of care economics and commons economics to transform the current economic system as a whole. And we have to maintain social and ecological qualities. So what are the challenges? We have to see and fully understand human and natural reproductive activity as an integral part of all commoning and bring about cultural civilizational change, overcome the dominance of the pre uh, prevailing economic logic. So this means changing our understanding and ways of life and work not only requires rethinking and re-evaluating, but also new language, a commodified language maybe. Um, now, there are three stories actually um, that are to illustrate the crisis of reproductivity that needs to be overcome include visions of transformation and attempt to combine caring and commoning and, of course, to raise questions. So, this is the first story. This is Jan. Um, Jan is a student. He does computer design, communication design and um, business administration here in Germany. He likes to share music, films, and he develops free software. He's a fan of Marcin Jakubowski's open source ecology. He produces a networked labor. He dreams of working in a co-working space once he's done with his studies. And he is really needs-oriented. With his 3D printer, he can develop a lot of stuff that he doesn't need to buy in the market that he produces just for himself. Just food he cannot print out yet, and that's not the joke. NASA is actually looking into these options to send astronauts into space and then print their food from a 3D printer. So since his uh, printer does not really produce that, his fridge is empty, he calls Hang Shong a um, food caterer. He is paid less than three hours uh, three euro per hour. He's from China. He works seven days a week at a restaurant, more than 10 hours a day. His boss has taken away his passport and he is exploited in the global production chains. This story has been carried to a human rights organization here in Berlin. So, and what he has in his little bag is Chinese dog. And that one was grown. Um, in an industrialized site. So a duck is a bird which likes to swim. It never swam in a pond. And um, animal rights activists would call that torture breeding. So what does this story tell us? Actually, um, Jan is young. He has no children yet, no relatives or friends in need of care, at least at the moment. So the question is, do all people with their different biographical backgrounds have the same opportunities to become a commoner or peer-to-peer -peer producer? 
The story also illustrates that the market considers reproductive activities such as preparing meals, for example, as service of little value. And Hong Shang and the uh, nameless duck represent the destructive components of the prevailing production processes. So the story indicates the question, what kind of quality and purpose of work do we want? Like decentralized, non-hierarchical, all-inclusive, what is the quality for work we want to promote? <coughs> And in a world of caring and commoning, we need to create new relations between people, society and animals and non-human nature. So I have another story for you. That's Sonia. Sonia is a caregiver in an elderly home. And this is emotionally challenging work. Um, she really likes the work she does, but she's poorly paid. And there are ever stricter requirements for nursing care. So all activities are accounted for in, for in time units. And like certain services, uh, because they need to increase efficiency to save money and time for their services, certain services are banned to be taken onto the counting sheet. Like for example, emptying the letterbox for the care receiver that she's visiting. Um, Sonia herself, because she doesn't earn so much, is worried about her old age and how she will actually live. So she thinks of maybe going into a multi-generational house. Or she may also consider, um, or she actually doesn't like to consider what her neighbor does, um, because her neighbor has hired Ola from Poland uh, as a caretaker. Um, and <laughs> So she considers maybe it's better to getting older in community. So what, that, what does that story tell us? This is an example which very, very much comes from this uh, German background here. So elder care works poorly paid. It's provided by the market, but poorly paid. Mm -hmm. Working conditions getting work, uh, worse. And nursing has been transformed into pieces, uh, into piecework. Um, and then we also see the, that uh, care which is provided in the families, not through uh, an employment as Sonia's job, um, that caregivers are under extremely high psychological and physical stress and they are unpaid. And the gender division of labor still persists. And we also see in this example the emerging transnational ethnicized care chains Sonia and Ola and Ola may provide for the needs of her family by hiring an Ukrainian woman that does the job in Poland then. So what's needed is a paradigm shift, a new evaluation or valuation um, criteria, appreciation of care work as a prerequisite for all other types of work. And we have to ask the question, who is responsible for ensuring this generative reproductivity of our society? A last story, this is the third story. Um, that's Marlin. Marlin actually um, is a mother of two. And yesterday evening, she was in a meeting with um, other peer parents, and they discussed the question, whether they should actually really, whether domestic labor should be paid. So um, Marlin has captured news from Venezuela where they are thinking of introducing basic income for mothers. So she finds that interesting and wants to bring that to her peer group. So she's also a good friend with Nila. Nila is from India and she has heard about uh, women uh, raising up there and criticizing the economic system, but they want their work to be recognized and, and, and respected, but they don't really want a monetization of all these activities. And here we have a young couple, Christine and Murad. Um, they are parents and they are both full-time working, so for them it's really hard to balance both. And they even uh, consider uh, to um, go for extra hours so that they can afford to buy services to have somebody clean or look after the children. <coughs> so we have this problem of connecting the separation between life and work and um, 
this evening, uh, Marlin um, has found a caretaker because she wants to go to an event where she can listen to a speaker from the US who is introducing the concept of time-based economics where labor is actually, every hour of labor is, is, is valued equally. So, um, one of the key issues which comes out of this is the question whether monetizing uh, and uh, yeah, mo uh, reproductive activities or even care of, and, uh, of and, and nature services both is an option. Because, um, I mean, most feminists say no, and I guess that commoners would also agree that's not really the solution. I mean, Joshua was relating to externalization, and this actually means we have to internalize. But um, then we really run straight into the pricing trap. How do we actually overcome this externalization of care work and nature services without falling into this prices, pricing trap? And if left unattended, um, it can really lead straight into the economization of life. And then, there are of, of course, uh, there is this livelihood protection trap uh, because we don't really know who cares in a world in which we care for others but still need money to survive. And there's also the time tra uh, trap, as the example of Murat and Christine said, who struggle with this famous work-life balance huh? that we also talk so much about and which is so deeply ingrained in our, in our mental setups. But this really <coughs> indicates that separation. So let me now conclude. Um, the market economy creates a distance between us and the consequences of our own actions. We see neither the working conditions under which people like Hong Chong have to suffer in the global uh, production chain, nor do we see the factory farming in northern Germany when buying cheap food. While the market seems to take away responsibilities due to the distance it creates, caring and commoning require proximity and responsibility. Care is relational. This means strengthening moral values and social norms are of extreme importance. Hence, we can conclude that the aim of developing a new way of living and working is twofold. First, expressing radical criticism of the destructive market logic and making efforts to push, to push it back and working on a vision. But we have to differentiate between the different levels of discussion, criticism or vision, transition strategy or options that have already been implemented, or those that are still evolving in our imagination. Creating new working environments, as I have descri described in the first story of Jan as a networker, helps us to blur the distinction between producer and consumer, leading us to the notion of the prosumer. <coughs> but prosumption does nevertheless not yet mean that we have fully overcome the separation of these two spheres of production and reproduction. So yet, um, they remain two sides of one and the same coin, namely reproductivity. The aim is to shape the whole of all those activities that are required for a resilient livelihood provisioning system, and this leads us, amongst others, to the vision of re-prosumption. We will have to use this combined uh, vision to reorganize work. Rethinking the role of human reproductive activity and its inherent nature in a generative commons network begs the question of how to ensure a fair balance of responsibility between individual and collective responsibility, between men and women, between people of different ethnic origin, between global north and global south, and so on. So reduction of working hours, minimum wages, decent working conditions, social and ecological standards are all essential on the way to bringing about change. There are transition strategies. But all of these actions refer to the remodeling of employment or paid, paid labor. This is undoubtedly very, very important. But there will only be room for 
paid employment or for employment in this vision of new working environments if it promotes the means for a good life for each individual, for the society and for nature. Paid labor will no longer be at the heart of work since it also includes alienated work or alienating work, which is part of the problem. And last but not least, it is up to trade unions to face up to the challenge of redefining their activities to embrace this new trend, reorganizing work not just for, but as a good life. So for this vision to be realized, we need new alliances, a variety of strategies to match the complexity of the various transformation requirements, since there is no blueprint for such a transformation, and we need room for collective thinking and experimenting. So on the road to changing thoughts, perceptions, values, and judgments, there are still more questions than answers. So we will have to explore them one by one, find answers and solutions. And I finally like to invite you to further explorations of rethinking the role of human reproductive activity in the red dot stream after the lunch break. <laughs>